and we want to welcome you uh, to the first annual conference of Journal for the Study of Anti-Semitism. People have come from very long and far. They're very tired, and I understand that it's not easy to be here. Leslie Claff would rather be in the Lake District. Paul, it's probably beautiful in Melbourne and springtime down there. There's a million other reasons to not be here. You're here for one reason. You're here because you care. You're here because you know that something is terribly wrong with the world right now, and it hasn't felt right since 9-11. You are the people who are trying to do something about it. According to the Stephen Roth Institute, about in 1989, there were less than 100 incidents of anti-Semitism, serious attacks where people were killed in the world, 89 and 1989. Uh, last year it was recorded, uh, or 1999, last year in 2009, there were more than 1,200 attacks reported. Most of the conflicts, according to the Stephen Roth Center, are uh, Muslim uh, instituted in Europe, uh, mostly by Muslim youth, triggered over the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. That's different than in the United States. In the United States, where you're relatively protected here, the statistics are, according to FBI.org, have been consistently about 1,400 attacks a year, or 1,400 incidents, different than serious attacks, but 1,400 incidents are reported. Canada, with one-tenth the population of the United States, is up near 1,400 attacks a year. The UK is approaching 1,000. France is closing, closing up on 1,000. Australia is closing to 1,000 attacks a year. Ge Germany has the dubious honor of having 1,500 attacks the most in the world at this point. The Israel is making mistakes, by the way. There's no question about it, and so is every other country. And the Israel is not above criticism, and I'm thinking of, of New York Times' Tom Friedman, who said it best. Criticizing Israel is not anti-Semitic, and saying so is vile. But singing, singling out Israel for opprobrium and international sanctions out of all proportion to any other party in the Middle East is anti-Semitic, and saying so, not saying so, is dishonest. What Tom Friedman was talking about and was addressing is the sea change in public opinion in the last decade from moving opinions about Israel and by association Jews from ambivalence to hate. And I'm old enough to remember that during the 1960s and even up to the early 1970s, Israel was considered a positive influence in the world. It couldn't do anything wrong. That may not have been accurate uh, because the truth usually lies somewhere in the middle. It can't do anything right. Countries can't do anything wrong. They make mistakes. But that's different than the what's going on in the world right now. It's a simple psychological principle, by the way. If you like someone or if you like a country, you tend to overlook or you cut people some slack. If you hate a country or hate a person, everything they do is irritating. Everything they do is held for disdain. At now what's going on in the world is the following. Boycotts are against Israel. Musicians are boycotting Israel to play there. There's boycotts on products. There's attempted boycotts on Israeli professors uh, and journals, which is in part how the Journal for the Study of Anti-Semitism began. Something is terribly wrong. Social perceptions are malleable. No longer is Israel the David fighting Goliath, but the reverse, where Palestinian homeland rights have brought in the political left, the middle, and reduce everything that Israel does to a moral wrong. What they don't see, what this conference hopes to point out, is the 1,500 years of Muslim anti-Semitism. Uh, the swastikas that are now painted on Jewish homes or the added police protection that is needed for high holiday, high holiday uh, services in every nation where Jewish houses of worship exist. 
when a Jewish kid is attacked or criticized on campus or pushed around by Muslim student associations, it does not matter because Jews and by association, anything Israeli are held to be in the, the wrong. And in that sense, they should be retaliated against. Something is terribly wrong. When 800,000 Jews were expelled from Arab lands after the creation of Israel, no one was concerned about Jewish rights. When one out of three were killed in the Holocaust, nobody was that concerned either. Or the estimated 400,000 that have been killed through millennia, no one was that moved. Something is terribly wrong. What changed is that people hear the sound bites on the news that's repeated ad nauseum over and over again that link words such as Nazi and Israel or apartheid state and Israel, and it has become a moral issue. But there's another side to the story, and listen to the book titles that have been out in the last year. The book titles tell the distortions, and you can't help think that we're vastly moving towards the Middle Ages when it comes to logic about what's really going on in the world. David Meyer Levy, title, History Upside Down. Melanie Phillips, The World Turned Upside Down. Bernard Henri Levy, Left in the Dark Times. Paul Berman, Flight of the Intellectuals. Lee Harris, Suicide of Reason. It makes Michael Berenbaum's title of the book make more sense. His title was called Not Your Father's Anti-Semitism. Michael may have been thinking about his father in America. The fathers in Europe already know what the anti-Semitism was like there. More to the point are titles that identify the real problem. Bruce Bauer, While Europe Slept, David Price Jones, The Closed Circle, Robert Riley's Closing of the Muslim Mind, Ephraim Karsh's Palestine Betrayed. He talks about the betrayal being not the Israelis, but the Arab leaders themselves. It all creates what Carolyn Glick has called, aptly titled, a shackled warrior. Something is terribly wrong. Like it or not, there's a war that we didn't start, and the war is to win hearts and minds and public opinion. In this war, militant Islam, as Dan Pipes calls it, does not listen to reason. It does not turn the other cheek. It does not care. It cares only about imposing Sharia and creating a caliphate state, uber alis. Instead of voicing concern, the West blames Israel and to appease their own Muslim populations, they keep quiet. Such appeasement is reminiscent of Neville Chamberlain, but it makes me want to tap these various nations on the shoulder and say, hey, Turkey, you want to recall your Israeli ambassador? Perhaps you want to remind yourself how well the Kurd situation is going there with your own people. Hey, Canada, critical of the Israeli passport scandal that killed a known terrorist, how are you doing with the Toronto 18 and the plot to kill Prime Minister Harper? Hey, Spain, with your ongoing criticism of Israel and your ADL survey that found the Spaniards saying the following, 74% agreed with this statement, doubled the rest of Europe. Quote, unquote, Jews have too much power in the international financial markets. Hey, Spain, how you doing with ETA and the trains? How come it's the case that Israel, a nation that's 60 years old, has produced, no more, has produced more Laurel laureates, Nobel laureates than you after 100 years? Or Ireland, so quick to call and talk about the Israeli apartheid uh, wall and it's very quiet about their own freedom wall in Belfast. How come theirs is needed and Israel's is not? Or England, so quick to criticize all things Israeli. And the BBC with nightly lead stories that tell about Israeli malfeasance. Remind yourself that in July of 2005, the subway bombings were not the work of Israelis or your Jewish citizens, and ask yourself how you felt when two of your sons were killed by the IRA last year. Multiply it now by 100, throw in ongoing rocket campaigns from Northern Ireland. How do you feel? Something is terribly wrong. We are here tonight, and we will hear lectures tomorrow about trying to make it right. Because a new language, language and a narrative ensues, and it's one that tries to play tricks. It says something like, one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. 
and it relativizes everything that's Israeli and rationalizes everything that's Arabic. No one asks, remind yourself, no one asks uh, if the Nazis were freedom fighters. Anti-Zionism, anti-Semitism is the new lingua franca of the time. It's how you have polite conversation when you have nothing in common. You can always diss Israel and talk about beating up on the Palestinians. No longer are they, are they, is, are they Muslims, nobody's an extremist. They are Gazans or they're poor Palestinians. Nothing is known about the life in Israel right now because it's not part of the ongoing Arab narrative that tries to shame Israel, create a schism between the West, and trounce on it every chance it gets. We stand tonight in the shadow of what's where the Twin Towers, and we have to ask ourselves why, almost a decade later, the Middle East crisis is still on the map. And Time Magazine came out three weeks ago with a picture of a Jewish star that indicted Israel for stopping the, uh, the, the Palestinian uh, peace talks. We stand in the shadow of the Statue of Liberty and ask why Emma Lazarus represents everything Islamic Jihad fears, a Jew, a woman, and a poet. We stand in the shadow of the UN whose voting record censuring Israel is 10 times what it is with every other nation in general and exceeds nation states such as Sudan and other known terrorist countries, including Iran. In a few minutes, you will hear from the eminent Richard Rubenstein, and tomorrow you will hear from experts on a multitude of topics. We are here as students. We are here as scholars. We are here as concerned citizens from around the world, and we are here because you care. We will try to do what scholars do and students and people who care do. We'll try to come up with ideas. We'll try to come up with solutions. There is much work to be done. There is much to understand. Welcome to the first conference on Muslim anti-Semitism for the Journal of the Study of Anti-Semitism. Thank you.